Now it's time for the bonus round. In addition to single and double acting pneumatic cylinders, pneumatic motors, you may run across some rather unique pneumatic actuators. The first bonus round actuator is called a pneumatic muscle, which is essentially an inflatable bladder wrapped in a sheath. As the bladder is inflated, the pneumatic muscle contracts, and when it's deflated, it extends. While pneumatic muscles do act quasi-linearly, the flexible nature of the pneumatic muscle allows it to do some pretty neat actions not permissible by a cylinder with a solid rod. I imagine our robot overlords of the future will be making extensive use of pneumatic muscles. The next bonus round actuator is a suction gripper or a vacuum cup. As we'll learn in later lectures, pneumatics aren't limited to just positive pressures above atmospheric conditions, but can also operate at vacuum conditions below atmospheric pressures. A common tool employed in vacuum circuits are suction grippers or vacuum cups, often used as end effectors for robots or load handling devices. The last bonus round actuator is an air bearing, which I don't really know if it officially classifies as an actuator or not, but there's no other category it fits in neatly, so I'm tossing it in and here. An air bearing is essentially an exhaust port that when spewing air into the environment creates a cushion of air, which reduces friction between it and the surface below or above it. Think of the friend you had as a kid with the air hockey table in the basement. That's essentially a giant air bearing. In keeping with the air hockey example, one might find big cutting tables at glass plants that act as giant air bearings, such that heavy plates of glass slide with ease. Air on it slides, air off it sticks. Yes, these really are as fun as they look. Now that we've taken a look at air preparation elements at the beginning of a pneumatic system and the actuators at the business end, it's time to take a look at all the disgusting stuff in the middle that make things work, notably directional control valves and the accessory components that modify pressure and flow. As we learned in the pneumatic directional control valve lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, directional control valves stop, start, and change direction of fluid flow. Directional control valves have a number of identifying characteristics. Ports are the ins and outs. Positions are particular functions characterized by unique flow paths. And lastly, the actuation method is a means a valve is shifted from one position to another. Actuation methods include, but are not limited to, manual levers and push buttons, mechanical rollers, air pilots, and electrical solenoids. Return springs either offset or center or directional control valve into a particular deactivated position. Since this should be a review of the aforementioned lecture dealing exclusively with the peculiarities of pneumatic directional control valves, Let's blaze through a sample selection of pneumatic directional control valves. The first example is a lever-operated 2x2 two two or two-port, two-position, normally closed valve. In the deactivated state, the spring offset moves the valve into a closed position that blocks 1 to 2. If an operator manually shifts the lever, the valve moves into an open position that allows passage from 1 to 2. The moment the operator lets go of the lever, the spring offset returns the valve to the closed position. The next example is a push-button operated 3x2 or three-port, two-position, normally closed valve. In a deactivated state, the spring offset moves the valve into a closed position that blocks passage from one to two, but vents two to exhaust port three. If an operator presses the push button, the valve moves into an open position that allows passage from one to two. The moment the operator stops pressing the push button, the spring offset would return the valve to the closed position. You might use this type of directional control valve to operate a single acting cylinder. Hooked in the following fashion, when an operator presses the push button, the cylinder pneumatically extends. When an operator releases the push button, the spring retracts the rod. Consider a bistable 3x2 directional control valve. Rather than an offset spring and push button, this particular valve is a twist knob actuator with a detent. Otherwise, it's identical to the previous 3x2 valve. Whereas the previous push button operated 3x2 valve has a spring offset that returned it to a preferred deactivated state, this is a bistable valve that maintains the last asserted state. You might find this type of valve employed as a venting shutoff valve. In this position, the passage from the pneumatic source to the circuit is open, and the circuit functions as intended. Whereas in this position, the passage from the pneumatic source to the circuit is closed, at the same time venting the system to atmosphere. You might use this position to ensure a system is depowered and safe to work on. The next example directional control valve is an air pilot operated 5x2 or 5 port 2 position valve. In the deactivated state, the spring offset moves the valve into a position that passes supply 1 to actuator port 2, blocks exhaust port 3, and exhaust actuator port 4 to exhaust 5. Upon receiving an air pilot signal, the valve moves into a position such that supply port 1 is routed to actuator port 4, exhaust port 5 is blocked, and dumps actuator port 2 to exhaust 3. You might use this type of directional control valve to operate a double acting cylinder. Hooked in the following fashion, 
lacking an air pilot signal, the cylinder is fully retracted. When air pilot signal is received, the valve shifts and the cylinder fully extends. You note the only two states for this particular system are fully extended and fully retracted and the cylinder won't stop midway. This last example directional control valve is a double solenoid operated 5x3 or 5 port 3 position valve. In the deactivated state, the two opposing centering springs keep the valve in a closed center position where all ports are blocked. When solenoid 1 4 on the left hand side is energized, the valve moves into a position that passes supply 1 to actuator port 4, blocks exhaust port 5, and vents actuator port 2 to exhaust port 3. Conversely, when solenoid 1 2 on the right hand side is energized, the valve moves into a position that passes supply 1 to actuator port 2, blocks exhaust port 3, and vents actuator port 4 to exhaust port 5. You might use a 5x3 directional control valve with a closed center to operate a double acting cylinder that needs to be paused and locked mid stroke. Hooked in the following fashion, lacking any electrical signal to either solenoid, the cylinder is locked in place with a closed center. When solenoid 1 4 is energized on the left hand side, the cylinder extends. And when solenoid 1 2 is energized on the right hand side, the cylinder retracts. Thus concludes our review of the directional control valve family. Let's now take a quick look at some components you may already be familiar with notably check valves, flow control valves, and various types of pressure control valves. You recall that check valves allow free flow in one direction and block it in another. Schematically, the free flow direction pushes the ball or poppet off the seat, whereas the block direction forces the ball or poppet onto the seat. You might see a check valve as part of other valves forming a bypass around it. Classic example being a variable flow control valve with a check valve bypass. Flow control valves are used to restrict, meter, or otherwise control flow rate to an actuator, thereby directly controlling actuator speed. Flow control valves are schematically represented by a variable restriction. Tightening the restriction reduces flow, whereas opening the restriction increases flow. The check valve bypasses forces flow through the restriction orifice in one direction, yet allows unrestricted flow in the opposite direction. As such, the proper orientation of a flow control valve with check valve bypass is orientation dependent. Manufacturers often indicate direction of control flow using an arrow. Alternatively, one might see a big arrow pointing in the unrestricted direction and a small arrow pointing in the control direction. In addition to inline flow control valves, you might find them directly mounted on the pneumatic cylinders. We'll review pneumatic flow control methods like meter in and meter out in later lectures. One may also encounter pressure control valves in pneumatic systems, like regulators, relief valves, and sequence valves. We already spoke about the first two, but it's helpful to round them up in one herd to compare and contrast. A regulator is a normally open valve with a pilot passage sensing pressure on its output. If it includes a venting or relieving passage back to atmosphere, it'll include an exhaust port. You may also see a normally open passage inside a relieving regulator, illustrated using a bidirectional arrow. A safety relief valve, in contrast, is a normally closed valve with a pilot passage sensing pressure on its input. When input pressure exceeds the set value, the relief valve opens and, importantly, exhausts it to atmosphere. The sequence valve looks a lot like a relief valve with a subtle but a very important difference. Like relief valve, sequence valves are also normally closed valves with a pilot passage sensing pressure on its input. When input pressure exceeds the set value, the sequence valve rather than exhaust an atmosphere like a relief valve, opens and allows flow to some other area in a pneumatic system, typically an actuator. I should note sequence valves in pneumatic systems are sometimes illustrated a little differently than sequence valves in hydraulics. You may also run across pneumatic sequence valves illustrated like this, where the sequence valve is kind of a pilot device. It senses pressure on a sensory pilot passage rather than directly opening its own primary passage it indirectly causes another valve to do so. Below the set value, this 3x2 primary valve blocks passage from 1 to 2 and vents 2 to 3. However, when pressure on the sensory pilot passage exceeds the sequence valve's set value, the sequence valve actuates the internal air pilot, which then opens the primary valve's passage from 1 to 2. We'll explore pneumatic sequence valves in later lectures. Let's now examine some of the oddball pneumatic components that you might not be familiar with just yet, or entirely unique to pneumatic systems. Related to one of the actuators we discussed earlier, the suction grip or a vacuum cup, a vacuum generator is a necessary component which sources the negative pressure necessary for the gripper's operation. A vacuum generator is schematically represented as a cone or a restriction with a pressurized input and an exhaust. As air speeds up to cram through the narrow restriction, it creates a negative pressure sucking in air through the V port. 
We'll examine vacuum circuits in later lectures. Another pneumatic oddity you may encounter is something known as a quick exhaust valve, which looks like an odd mix of a pilot passage, a check valve, and sometimes a silencer. If the schematic symbol includes a silencer, it'll be on the piloted side. As the name implies, a quick exhaust valve shortens the length of the path necessary to exhaust an actuator, thus speeding up some desired direction. We'll examine quick exhaust valves in later lectures. Lastly, not necessarily unique to pneumatics, as they're sometimes found in hydraulic systems, you may also encounter pneumatic logic valves like AND or dual pressure valves and OR or shuttle valves. These valves make predictable decisions based on input conditions and are often used in pilot controlled systems to govern the action of a larger pneumatic system. An AND or dual pressure valve works like this. There must be a pilot signal at both A and B for there to be an output. In contrast, an OR or shuttle valve works like this. There must be a pilot signal at either A or B for there to be an output. We'll examine pneumatic logic valves in later lectures. All right, that is all we are covering today. I will readily admit this is not everything you might encounter in a pneumatic system, but if I gave you a dollar for every new component you didn't see in this lecture, and you gave me a nickel for every component you did, you'd be broke in a month. I will also say there's different ways to illustrate the same device, so don't freak out when you see something new on a schematic. It just might be a different method of illustrating something you're already familiar with. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of crosstalk between hydraulics and pneumatics, and you should be able to figure it out if you spend some time thinking it through. This being said, I did introduce some entirely new components we'll revisit in later lectures in greater detail. Until then, this concludes this lecture. In conclusion, this lecture examined the schematic symbols for common pneumatic components including, but not limited to, source elements like motor prime movers, compressors, receivers or tanks, filters, regulators and lubricators, actuators like cylinders, motors, muscles, vacuum cups and air bearings, and all the disgusting stuff in the middle that makes it work, like directional control valves, check valves, flow control valves, pressure control valves, vacuum generators, quick exhaust valves, and logic valves. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.